we started a series a few weeks back on the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Really, our best friend is the Holy Spirit, and we're in this year of pursuit. And the Holy Spirit's an interesting thing uh, because if I told you, and I've said this almost in every message I've preached, if I told you that we were no longer going to speak on Jesus, we were going to no longer talk about Jesus, I asked how many people would go find a new church, and pretty much all of you raised your hands, as you should, right? Because that's like saying we're no longer going to talk about God in a body on the planet, right? And yet, there's this appetite or this sense that we should never talk about the Holy Spirit. And it's almost worse to say we're never going to talk about the Holy Spirit than it would be to say we're never going to talk about Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is the present being on the planet right now, right? And, and it's a very real person of God that's here in this place. And when you're talking about the Holy Spirit... Um, we're talking about our need for the Holy Spirit operating in our life and, and that he is to be our best friend, that he's closer than a friend because he's literally living in us. Like when you came to Christ, you were baptized in salvation, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. Then you're, and you see the kingdom of God and we're living. Like right now, we have to imagine we live in the kingdom of God. We're living in a kingdom of God. We're not trying to redeem the kingdom of the world. You, you will fail every time to redeem the kingdom of the world. You're not going to change the world. It's always going to be evil because its king is Satan. We're trying to rescue people from the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of the air, and bring them into the kingdom of God so they can experience the freedom, they can experience the power of the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit, as we walk in the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit works in us. But you can't see him, just like you can't see the wind. Can anyone see the wind? You can't see the wind. They don't have like night vision goggles where you have wind vision goggles. You can't see the wind. You see the effect wind has on things. You, like, you know there's wind. You don't doubt there's wind because you can feel the wind on your face. You can also see the wind move trees and leaves, right? So you know the wind exists. The same is true with the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit. You can't see the kingdom of God, but you can see its effect on things. You, it's, it's, it, it impacts things. You can't see the Holy Spirit, but you can feel its impact. You can feel it in your own being, and you see its effect on people's lives around you. And so the gifts of the Spirit are important. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And I think there's why so many young people are not interested in the church because they've heard a lot about the power of God because it's just been talk. They just don't see it. They're not experiencing it in their life that God still does do miracles. He heals. He still does supernatural things. And, and when they see that, they know it's real. They know the kingdom of God is real. They're more open to understanding it better. And one of the things we've ignored, because even with the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, he makes us uncomfortable. It, you know, like we, maybe you grew up in a church that said the Holy Spirit is no longer for today, which is funny because Jesus is still for today. God the Father is still for today. I think the Holy Spirit probably is still for today, right? And, and the gifts of the Spirit are no longer for today, really. So are you saying that if people get healed or you minister and heal, that that was the devil? I didn't know the devil was healing people now, right? The devil doesn't heal people. The devil isn't doing miracles. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. So the reality is if people are still being healed, the Holy Spirit is still doing his thing. Right? The gifts of the Holy Spirit are still operating in our life. And if you're uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit, can I just put you at ease and say that's okay? Because it can be weird and uncomfortable if you've never experienced it before because that's our human natural reaction to anything we've never experienced before. But just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean it isn't true. Just because it seems strange doesn't mean it isn't true. It isn't what God has planned for your life. It's a matter of then, okay, 
I'm open to understanding what it is. If every good and perfect gift comes from the Father, you say, Father, I want to understand this more, and he'll begin to open your eyes to things you once thought were weird and strange that the enemy wanted you to think was weird and strange so that you would never walk with the Holy Spirit, that you would never understand the thing that's living in you. You know what I love about God? Even if you're uncomfortable about the Holy Spirit, he still put it in you. Even if you think it's weird, if you're a believer and you believe in Jesus, it's still in you. But wouldn't you want to understand what, is, what you're actually sharing your body with? Because the reality is people say, well, I think I would believe that the Holy Spirit was real if he was an actual person. Well, one, I would argue that God went into Jesus' body and people didn't believe he was God. So I don't think just the Spirit being there would make you believe. But the reality is, the Holy Spirit is in physical form. And you say, where? In your seat. You are, you are cohabiting with the Spirit of God. Isn't that amazing to think about? Like, I'm sharing this body with God. And you say, oh, I don't know if I believe that. Well, then you don't believe the Scripture that says you're a temple of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is there. When you begin to understand that, you'll understand that the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are active in you are just waiting to be released. They're just waiting to be released out of your physical body that is just waiting to participate with you. So here are the nine gifts. The first three we talked about a couple of weeks ago was the discerning gifts, the word of knowledge, discerning the Spirit's word of wisdom. Anybody use those gifts over the last few weeks? Just raise your hand, wave at me, and say, do you use those gifts? Excellent. Okay, and then last week they talked about dynamic gifts, which are faith, healing, and miracles. And that just shows how kind I am as a pastor to let the campus pastors preach on that because I really wanted to preach that one and they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they wanted to, so I let them. Um, but here's the third one is the declarative gifts. And the declarative gifts are ones that, quite frankly, are the easiest to check out on by people in the church because in your mind you're thinking this. And you're like, how do you know I'm thinking it? I can just tell. I can read your mind. You're thinking, I am never doing that. Right? And you're saying, well, what are the gifts? Prophecy, which quite frankly, people will do prophecy. That's, that's not, it's the tongues and interpretation of tongues. Like in your mind, you're thinking, I'm never doing that. You can talk about it. You can explain it, pastor, but I ain't doing that because that's too weird or that's too difficult, or I don't know if I could do that. So we're going to talk about what they are, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit take the rest. Does that sound okay? So 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now about the gifts of the spirits, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to understand what they are. 1 Corinthians 14 once says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. 1 Corinthians 1 7 says, Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await, wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Really, God wants us to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Every single person in here. If you're a believer, if you're a believer, God wants you to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And, and there's the baptism of salvation where the Spirit comes and lives in you. There's a baptism in water. And then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit where the Spirit comes and rests upon you. It's very important to be baptism. But the, Paul says, I need you to move from elementary teachings and to walk in the kingdom of God. I need you to be the kind of believer, the world. So how does the world know that you're a believer? Through your love, right? We're, we're going to talk about that. I'll get to that in a moment. But I want to do a review of something. What are the spiritual gifts? What are the spiritual gifts? What they are not are merit badges. If you operate and you prayed for someone to get healed, it doesn't make you a better believer than someone else. They're not, you don't possess them. They're not your gifts. They're the gifts of the Holy Spirit that he, that he operates through you. And they're not magic. You know, so many people watch somebody else. Well, this is how they did it, and so I'm going to do it exactly like that. They're not magic. Simon the sorcerer says, teach me how to do it, as if it was a magical formula that was operating. It's not magic. It is, it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. What are they? They're for the common good of the body of Christ. And number two, they're tools in your toolbox to operate in. Okay? So 
what's interesting is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it talks about tongues and the operation of those gifts. But you know what's in chapter 13? How many know what chapter 13 is? 1 Corinthians 13 is the chapter, right, the love chapter. Isn't it interesting? They put it right in the middle of, of the gifts, talking about gifts. And I really believe they did that because you've, you first need to pursue love before you pursue the gifts. And what is love? It's God. It's God. God is love. I think what Paul is saying, I don't care if you're the most gifted person in the world and you operate in all the gifts in the Spirit. If you don't minister in love, keep your mouth shut. First Corinthians says, if you speak in the tongues of angels and of men, but you have no love, it's as though you've said nothing, right? If you give all of your money to the poor, but you don't love the poor, it's as if you've given nothing. It's, it really is, you know, when they say, you know, you get to heaven, it says uh, that your good and bad works will be judged. You know what the di distinguishing point is? It's love. It sins. You're not, it's not judging, it's not, a, it didn't say good works and sins, it said good and bad works. Oh, well, how do you have a bad work? A bad work is a work done without love. And those things you did without ever loving the people will burn up in eternity, but those that were done out of a love for people, see, this is the reality. When you love people, you will want to operate in the gifts because you care about what they're going through. When you love a person and they're sick, you'll want to operate in the gift of healing. If someone is, if you love people and they're going through something which is stressing them, and you want to give them a word of wisdom, that like that God, God if, when you love people, you pursue the operation of the gifts in your life in order to minister to people because you love people. You, it's out of love you're motivated to doing, not, not obligation, not trying to be a better Christian or trying to be a smarter Christian. It's because they just love people. But without love, it's pointless. There's no, there's no importance to it. So I'm going to talk about the first gift, the first declarative gift, with his prophecy. And the, here, here's the definition of it. A message of encouragement from God through a person to person or persons. Prophecy, we could talk for a whole series on prophecy. Prophecy is found in the Old Testament. It's also in the New Testament. There are people who prophesied that were far from God, and God used their mouth to speak and prophesy. I think what you, you there's so many people they're afraid to prophesy. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know that. That the problem is you think it's got to come out of your brain rather than understand that the Holy Spirit is in you, just needing to use a willing mouth. It's like you got to say, Holy Spirit, my, I'm willing for you to use my mouth anytime you want, right? How many would like that a lot more than, than already? You know, because when you use it, sometimes it's not always bringing great results. <laughs> like you're like, Holy Spirit, can you shut my mouth when I shouldn't be saying something? And I'm willing to give you the use of mouth, my mouth when, when you want. So, so literally, you're king over your body. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. And the Holy Spirit's waiting for you to submit the use of your body to him when he needs to use it. Does that make sense? So, 1 Corinthians 14. If you have a Bible, pick this up. If you don't have a Bible, download the Bible app and you read this with me. 14, 1 through 5. It says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Do you see what this says? Especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So when we've talked about when a person prays in tongues, doesn't he need an interpretation? No, not when he's talking to God. God doesn't need what they're saying in a tongue interpreted. He understands. So you, you could speak to God in tongues without interpretation. We call it a prayer language. It's kind of easier for us to understand that. There's not really place where it says that, but a prayer language is when you're talking to God, and when I do that in a tongue, I'm edifying only me, which means it's building me up. I'll explain this in a moment, what building me up is. It's edifying me, and I'm talking to God directly, perfect prayer, 
meaning it's coming from my spirit man, your three parts, your body, your soul, and your spirit. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Your body is your physical body. And the perfect part of you is the spirit part of you that's putting you at salvation. You're born again. That spirit was born in you. Some say it was dormant. Some say it was actually born. When you came to Christ, it was born in you, okay? You're speaking from that place of the spirit to the Lord in his language, okay? And, and it, I believe it will be the language when we get into eternity that we will speak. Some say, well, it's Hebrew. No, Hebrew is not a perfect language, and we're not going to be speaking Hebrew in heaven, okay? It's, it's going to be a perfect language when we get to heaven. Um, but, but when we get a message, and I'll talk about this, when we get a message and it's given in tongues, in order to edify the body, they have to understand it. So there must be an interpretation because it comes from God to the body, right? I'll explain it in a moment. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their what? Three words, strengthening, encouragement. Is there anywhere there where it says rebuke? Is there anywhere in there where it says correction? And yet, so many people are prophesying in correction and rebuke, and nowhere in the Bible does it say you're prophesying in correction and rebuke. That's an Old Testament use of prophecy, but it is not how Paul defined prophecy in the New Testament. It's not correction and rebuke. It's actually strengthening, encouraging, and comforting. What did Jesus say? I didn't come into the world to condemned the world, but that the world through me might be strengthened, encouraged, and comforted. Right? It's, you say, well, how do you know that? Because the same characteristics Jesus came in the world to do, the Holy Spirit still demonstrates. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like for everyone to speak in a tongue. So Paul is saying, through the Holy Spirit, I would love for everybody to speak in tongues. And then he makes a statement, which then people say negates what he just said. No, Paul says, I want, I would that everybody spoke in a tongue. But then he comes to next, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified, that the church may be edified. So let's take a look at these three words, strengthening, encouraging, and comforting. Have you ever received a prophecy and it didn't strengthen you, encourage you, or comfort you? Has anyone ever prophesied to you and it never strength, it didn't strengthen, encourage, or comfort you? All right? Anyone in here? Someone prophesied? Either this is a bad testament of the fact that we're not prophesying and Paul is saying we should be, if no one is, because how many know at some point in your life you're going to get a prophecy that is not even close to comforting and strengthening and encouraging, right? I mean, my wife and I have received some prophecies in our ministry after, you know, being married, and they didn't do any of those things. And you know what we didn't do? We didn't get hurt. You know what else we didn't do? We didn't throw prophecy in the toilet and flush it. Because the reality is if it doesn't strengthen, encourage, or comfort, we just let go. I'm not going to rebuke the person. I'm not going to, I'm not going to attack the person for doing it. They came to me, unless they were trying to be attacking, they came to me trying to bless us, and it just wasn't. It wasn't work. So I'm not getting hurt by it. Do you, do you know we live in a world that just seems to want to get hurt by everything? Like, we read into everything, like, what bad thing are they trying to tell us, you know? And God says he's going to help you in your parenting as you raise your child. What are they saying? I'm not a good parent? No, they're saying God's going to help you. We could all use it. Amen? It's like, it's like th there's this sense, like, when you receive it, you stop and you consider is this comforting? Is it encouraging? And, it, and is it strengthening? And here's the other thing to consider. If it is, you will notice it is. Yeah. Because when the word comes, it won't come to you as a word from a man. It will come to you as a word from God. 
And a word from God always brings life. It's a creative word. He created the world with a word. And when it creates in you strength, it builds you up. Here, here are the definitions really of strength. And so, so if someone gives you a prophetic word and it's not true, just, just, you know, blow, I can't even tell you one of the words in front of everybody. My wife would kill me if I told you the word. That's how bad the word was. And it was given to her in front of the entire congregation by a speaker that came to speak. We were the senior, we were the executive pastors. And they gave a word to her that was totally off base, right? And from the platform, he gave a word. And we could have let that hurt us. We could have let that affect us in a negative way. But you know what we did? We just let it go. Because I don't want, I don't want the enemy to give us a word that embarrassed us in front of everybody and then destroy us on top of it. Now I lost where I was at. So, so, the, so strengthening, well, I'll get to that. I guess I'll get to that. So there's this sense of correction. You know, um, a lot of times people want, they have an opinion about other people, like friends or an opinion about it, but they don't want to actually go to the person and tell them what their opinion is or what they think. So they go, you, can I talk to you for a little bit? I, I feel like God's telling me that I should tell you this. Right? I've always, when people do that, I always want to go like, you know what? I want to go to one of their friends and say, John is telling me to tell you this. Because would you like it if I use, put your name on my opinion for something that you didn't agree with or you didn't say? That's why you have to be careful. The prophecy isn't intended to correct that's not, God didn't give you, a, he's not going to give you a word to correct. There, there's a difference between when you, what prophecy is and you going in and saying, hey, this is an area I think that's affecting your life. You might want to take a look at it. And the Lord's bringing me here. I feel like the Lord spoke to me, but it's not a prophetic word. It's something the Lord put in my heart. Can I talk to you about it? It's called discipleship, yeah. right? And um, what I've noticed what I've noticed is we are probably the most uncovered generation of Christians in the history of Christians. You say, well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> what I mean is, who in your life currently could come and talk to you about something you're making bad decisions in and you wouldn't get offended? You wouldn't get angry? Who? Don't, don't, I have people. No, just who? Who do you have in your life that protects you, that God could speak to when you're not listening to Him because you just want to do, that could come into you, you know they love you, they care about you, but could come to you and, and gently bring correction in an area you needed. You know, David, King David, had Nathan. When David wasn't listening, who's your Nathan? Who's your Nathan? Who's in your life? But there's, there's a lot of people that see things and they have opinions. How many you know we're also very opinionated society, right? Very opinionated. We have all our opinionated. And, and you know, God says, one, uh, you know, I even forgot to mention this, is, is, you know, God is love. And how do people know that we're people of God? We love people. Well, how do you know your love for people is different than the people of the world? You love people who persecute you. You love people who disagree with you. That even after they attack you and come after you, you go to them and you still love them. I mean, think about this. How are you doing with that? Strengthening means placing one stone on top of another to build up. When I have a prophetic word, 
I'm going to strengthen someone with that word, it means that when I'm done giving the word, they feel built up. Encouragement means putting courage into someone by the word of God. It means that word, when I give that prophetic word through the Holy Spirit speaks through my mouth and I give that prophetic word, that there's courage in them that wasn't there before where they were afraid before. Now they're not afraid. Now they have courage. Now they have, like, faith is in them. They're built up and they're in cur- their courage. And then comfort means to console. You ever, someone dies and you want to go and you want to comfort them and you just don't know what quite to say, what you should do is say, Holy Spirit, is there a word you can speak through my mouth that will, that will impart comfort inside of them? And if there's not, don't make it up. Just sit Shiva with them. You say, well, what's that? That's just sit there and be present. Cry with them, hug them, listen to them. You don't have to say anything. Don't say all the platitudes that mean nothing. Let your words be the words of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and just listen. It's like we always feel like we need to talk when we should just listen and just feel with them. Amen? Prophecy is by faith. It's an important. That's no surprise. Romans 12, 6 says, We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in the proportion to his faith. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what, they, what is said. 1 Corinthians 14, 31 says, For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. And in 32, it says, The spirit of prophets are subject to the control of the prophet. So you, when you prophesy, the Holy Spirit isn't just going to take over your tongue and speak. The Holy Spirit will give you, it will literally impress on you to say something. And a lot of times when I prophesy, I don't have the whole thing. It just, the first thought comes. And as I begin speaking, it's like the Holy Spirit just gives me the words to speak even as it's happening. And so you don't need to get the whole prophetic thing. And oftentimes when I've given, per- and, and, and I've prophesied a lot, a lot. This is a gift that the Holy Spirit has used a lot in my, my life and ministry. Is most of the time I don't remember most of what I say. Because it really isn't flowing from my brain. It really is flowing. Like it, it has to go through your brain to get out your mouth. But the prophetic word that the Lord gives, and, and you'll know it's God because, you know, the one question I get from a lot of people, there are two questions I get more than any others. How do I know the will of God? And how do I know the voice of God? And how you know the voice of God is there is a difference between your thought and the thought of God put in your mind. And over time, you just know that that's God. You know that that's God speaking. And, and I, always, I always know that there are times where, where you have to have faith that this is a word God's given you. Whenever you give a prophetic word, it takes a certain level of faith to give that word because you don't want to not say something that's from God, but don't let it paralyze you from saying what it is. Does this make sense? How many know what I'm talking about? Like, there was a time where I miserably failed. I'm in the elevator, and I use this illustration a lot in sermons. You'll hear it because it's the one thing that sticks out to me. I'm in an elevator, and the Lord's speaking to me, you need to, you need to preach the gospel to that person. And in my mind, immediately I said, but I can't preach the gospel in two floors because we were going up on the elevator. I'm like, I don't have a two-floor gospel message, Right? And, and, the, and the reality is, is I never preached it because I let my mind prevent me from doing what I knew the voice of God was saying. It takes faith to believe that the Lord was going to give me a prophetic word for that person that would have been the gospel I needed to preach in two floors. It's faith. It's trusting if, if the Holy Spirit does that. So... What, what I want you to really consider, and I, w- I want more than any of the other gifts that you've heard over the last two weeks, I want you to become people who prophesy. I want you to work in it. I want you to try. And if you make a mistake and it's not God, the, and someone brings a prophetic word to you, just throw it out. Just throw it out. 
Don't let you hurt by it. Don't think, what were they? Why did they give me that? What are they thinking? What do they think about? Don't, don't read into it. Don't let the enemy. But, but you as well. You know, most people love getting a prophetic word because it builds them up. It encourages them and it comforts them. And when it comes, it's transformative. It makes a difference, right? But a lot of times we don't ever sow prophetic words. We want other people to submit to the Holy Spirit and to give a word, but we don't ever submit to do it because it puts me out on a limb. It, it, make, it could make me look bad. Right? Now, one more thing before we move on. A prophetic word should check, be checked in your brain before it comes out your mouth. There is a pastor, true story, he said, a guy got up and said, Thus saith the Lord that he is going to cause you to cross over the Red Sea as Noah crossed over the Red Sea. A few seconds later, he thought, correction, it wasn't Noah, it was Moses who crossed the Red Sea. God apparently forgot. It was a long time ago. Right? You know, check, uh, check to make sure <laughs> that this case, Lord, is this your word is this what you want me to say and you will know because it will keep coming back to you that you need need to go and talk to him about it now the next two i'm going to give you quickly i should give it way more time but declarative gift is tongues it is it's a message from god in a language unknown to the person through whom the message comes first corinthians 14 2 says for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to god indeed no one understands them that's why it needs an interpretation not a translation, an interpretation. You ever heard a message that went on for half an hour and the, trans, the interpretation was two minutes? It's because an interpretation tells you the intent of what was being said in tongues. Now, why are they important? The next two gifts are tongues and interpretation in tongues. Why are they important? And we, I, more than ever, and can I be honest? I've been in a lot of states. Minnesota struggles with this a lot. A tongue, when someone gives a message in tongues, why is it so important to respect that tongue? Because it's literally from God. The creator of the universe wants the body to be edified by a message, right? It's coming right, but you know what we do? is we get through it as fast as we can. We try to tell everybody, this is in the Bible, so don't get uncomfortable. And then there's an interpret, and, it, and, and we have the interpretation, but we never consider what's said. We just think, oh, let's get through that. We're spiritual because we have it, but we're not actually going to let it impact anything. It's like having God walk up on the stage, give a word, and we say, thanks, God, have a great day. Now I've got a great message for you today. Like, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Like, if God took the time to move on some scared soul's life because I've never met anyone except those that feel like they need to speak in tongue every, every Sunday morning, right? I've never met anyone who's had a true tongue that isn't a little worried. <laughs> you know why? Because the Bible says if you speak in a tongue for the edification of the body, you're responsible for the interpretation. So they're like, they give the tongue and they're like, dear God, please let someone else have an interpretation. Otherwise, it says you're to keep quiet or give the interpretation of what you just said. Now, I know and I realize after telling you this, I've probably done more to scare you from doing this gift <laughs> than inspire you from doing this gift. But here's the reality. When the Holy Spirit wants to speak to the body as a whole, and he uses a tongue, and it happens to be you he gives it to, you will know that it's him. And you should speak with confidence that it is him. And you need to know this. We're not going to hit you over the head. We may come to you later and say, you know, I don't know if that was a word from the Lord because there was no interpretation, but we're not going to embarrass you. And we're not going to attack you because if anything we've learned as a pastoral team, it's that we need more of the operations of the gifts than less, right? And, and we need you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We need you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because if anybody in this world needs, if, if, if there's anything in this world needs more of, it is us operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
So can I give you permission to fail? Because in that failure, you're going to learn. In that failure, the weirdness and the craziness of all of this is going to fall away. And, and for me, I, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit as young, you know, like 11. So I really struggle to understand how uncomfortable it is for people because it's just so normal and it makes total sense. So I can forget if you were raised and you were told this was from the devil, that this is not of God, how uncomfortable this can be. I get it. But remember, just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean it isn't from God. And when you experience it, you will realize it's not just amazing. It is exactly what God's not calling a few to. He's calling every believer to. Because the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. It's a matter of power. There's power that operates in our life. And that power must always be accompanied with love. You must love people, and it will then compel you to want to operate in the gifts to transform, uh, see a transformation in their life. How many are saying, okay, I get it, I get it? You're saying you're getting it, right? Okay, okay. If you want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit more in your life, will you stand? And you're saying, Pastor, that, that, that makes me feel like I got to give in to peer pressure. Absolutely. <laughs> you could say, I'm standing, but I'm sitting in my spirit right now. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. If you want an operation of the spirit. That, okay, so you're standing. Now just uh, remember, the Holy Spirit's already in you. It's just surrendering to the spirit and saying, Holy Spirit, whenever you want to participate, I'm willing. Whenever you speak to me, I'm willing, and I'm going to do that. You say, but don't I need to get a PhD in healing first? No, you do not, okay? That's not, this isn't about knowledge. This is about the Holy Spirit doing it. You ready? Because he's going to do it in your life. So Father, right now I pray for every person that's standing in this room. You know their heart. You know where they're at. You know where they're at. Lord, I, I pray for a commissioning that goes on, a type of commissioning that you had planned for them a long time ago, that they would begin to, to operate in their workplaces and in their neighborhoods and in their homes, not just in this church, Lord God, that as they go out into these fields of harvest, Lord God, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit would not only operate in their life, but it would become so normal for them that they wouldn't even think about it as anything else but what is, what is the kingdom of God, that it would just be like they're walking in the kingdom of God on this planet. And to the fear, to fear, I command it to leave right now. Love chases away all fear right now. I command fear to leave. I command the doubts or confusion to leave. The weirdness that may be there from being told something from families of origin or past teaching. Lord God, I pray that that would just go out the door and they would sense your spirit saying amen to this thing in their heart. So be it. So be it. So be it in them. I pray in Jesus name. Amen.